it again. Okay, so we're Genesis chapter 24, the story of Eliezer finding a wife for finding a, a wife for his master, Abraham's son Isaac. He finds um, the girl named Rebecca. He, she passes the test of kindness. Last week we read how he gives her gifts and the symbolism of the gifts. And finally, um, Eliezer says, okay, time to go. We want to go, we want, let's go home. We want to get married. He wants the girl to take her, take her back to Israel. That would mean leaving her native country. So over here, the family gets very nervous. And they say, <clears throat> they say that she should wait ten, a, a year or, two, or 10 months, right? It's because someone agrees to get married in the ancient world, uh, you, need, you need time to prepare. Now you need time to prepare too. But in those days, that was the custom. He says, no. Eliezer says, um, you know, this is a sign from God that God wants this to happen. Do not, let's not delay. And they don't know what to do. The end is they do something very, very strange. It's not strange in the modern world, but it's strange in the context of when this story happened almost 4,000 uh, 4, years ago. So they say, let's call the girl, Nikra Lanara, let's call the girl and we'll ask her opinion. So it's not like the family is marrying her off, but they need her consent, um, whether or not she wants to go. And she is the one who decides and says, yes, she wants to go. But if you look here, okay, let's open the Rashi. Um, so, let's look, at, let's look at chapter 24, verse 50. Um, if the art scroll, it's on page 117. So we'll just get a little bit, a little, a little bit of the story. After Eliezer tells him the whole story, Lava number two will answer and said, this matter has emanated from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. In other words, you can't get involved. It's clearly from Hashem. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be a wife for your master's son as the Lord has spoken. Now it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he prostrated himself to the ground to the Lord. Then he gives them gifts. They eat, they drink, they sleep over. They wake up in the morning, verse 54. And he said, send me away to my master. And her brother and her mother said, let the maiden stay with us a year or 10 months. Afterward, she will go. In other words, earlier they said in principle, yeah, take, take, take the girl and go. Now they're saying, just come right in. Just put. Okay. No worries. Okay, so we had earlier in verse um, oh, so earlier they said in verse 50, I'm sorry, verse 51, they said in principle, verse 51, they said, yeah, take Rebecca and go, right? Behold, Rebecca is before you, take her and go and let her be a wife for your master's son as the Lord had spoken. But that's in principle. Practically, the next morning, Eliezer says, let's go back to Israel. What does she say? What do they say? They say, slow it down. We need a year. We need 10 months. We have to get ready. Verse 56 on page 119, um, um, verse 56, Eliezer says, uh, no, you can't hold me back. We got to go. This is obviously Hashem's plan. We saw everything worked out perfectly. So let's make this happen. Let's not stall. Uh, but he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has made me, made me, since the Lord had made me, had made, made my way prosper, send me away and I will go and I will go to my master. That's the surprising verse 57. And they said, let us call the maiden and ask her. And that's what they do. And they summon Rebecca and they said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Then they sell and send her away and they give the blessings. But there's a fascinating Rashi. What does Rashi say on this verse? I'm pretty sure it's Rashi. Yeah, beautiful Rashi. It's, it's actually, like I said, it's surprising if you think about the context when it was said. So I'm opening up Show Rashi's commentary on verse, what was it, 57? And it's on the screen right here, but I'll read it in the English. It says Rashi, from here we learn and ask her. It's even before Rashi comes to the Medrash. So it's over 2,000 years. From here we learn that we may not marry off a woman except with her consent, right? Because that's the biblical story. The biblical story is they wouldn't consider sending her without a permission, without, without asking her. And Rashi says it's not just that story, that family, but that becomes the moral, moral way to do business, which was unusual in the ancient world up to uh, relatively recently. So that was that. And next, they send her off and they give her a blessing. 
They, they, bless, they, they, they bless her, beautiful blessing, 60. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you become thousands of myriads and may your seed inherit the cities of their enemies. Rashi has a beautiful interpretation. They knew in the family that Abraham was blessed. Abraham was their great uncle, right? But Abraham, as we'll see later in this parsha, and we know from Yishmael, but later he has many more sons. Abraham has many children. So what's their blessing? That the divine blessing to Abraham should material should become should come through you, right? So you should be the recipient of that divine of that, Abra, that Abrahamic blessing. That's what you see in Rashi on, on sixty. I'm reading on the screen. May you become thousands of myriads. May you and your seed receive that blessing that was stated to Abraham on Mount Moriah, and I will surely multiply multiply your seed, etc. May it be his will that those children shall be from you and not from another woman. So in other words, they understood that. that Abraham is a special man. They even heard, they must have heard of the story of the binding of Isaac. And now they say that the blessing should be through her. Okay, they go. And Rebecca and the maidens arose and rode on the camels and they followed the man and the servant took Rebecca and left. Okay, now everything is fine. Now what's interesting is the meeting between Isaac and Rebecca is a little bit strange. And it's not clear exactly why we have this, some of this biograph, I don't want this anecdotal information because it tells you about the meeting, but it's not clear what it's trying to say. And it's not clear that this is important information. And it's also a little bit unusual. So what we're gonna to try to do, we're gonna to try to read verse 60, 60, 60, verse 61, 62, and 63 and 64. And then we wanna see what, it, what do we make of this? What is the Torah trying to tell us with this information? And also what is this, how is this informed by the past events in Isaac's life? And how does this inform the future events? Because just look at these verses, it doesn't seem like it's so, it's so necessary or insightful, um, but obviously every, the sages are looking to see what's the bigger picture here. So here's the story. Verse 61 we read, right? No, Rebecca, no, we didn't read 61. And Rebecca and her maidens arose and rode the camels and they followed the man and the servant took Rebecca and left, meaning he left her homeland, which was Haran, her town, which is Haran. Verse 60, now Isaac was on his way, coming from Be'er Lachai Ro'i, and he dwelt in the land of the south. So we're setting up this meeting, but at the meeting, you want to know not only where Isaac was, but where he was coming from. Now, that's very strange. If you want to say they met each other at Starbucks, okay, fine. Say they met at Starbucks. No, they met each other from Starbucks after they were coming from, where were they coming from? From, I don't know. What, what do people shop? Brooks Brothers. No, that, that shut down on Greenwich Avenue. It must have been something else. I'm sorry? Whole Foods. Okay. What do I care where he was coming from? Tell me where he met. All right. Tell me where he met. So, so that's an issue here, right? Isaac and also the, 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 the Hebrew and maybe the English as well, but the Hebrew is certainly strange. The Yitzchak ba mibo. Yitzchak was on it. They translate, was on his way coming from, and if on his way, comma, coming from the air, the high road, they don't, want to, they don't want to translate the way it translates. What it translates is, how would you, what would you say? Yitzchak came from coming. Instead of saying Yitzchak came from the air, the high road, Yitzchak came from coming, the air, the high road. It just like, it doesn't make sense. Okay. So the question is, what is he doing here? What does this even mean? What do I have to know where he's coming from? But he's in the south. Let's continue. And Isaac went forth to pray in the field toward evening. Now it says lasuach. Lasuach literally could mean speak. It could also mean to observe the plants. In Hebrew, sichim is plants. The sages say that when verse 63 says, Isaac went forth, lasuach, Isaac went out to speak in the field, it means to pray. You see that in Rashi? Again, I have Rashi on the... Screen here, I apologize. And at some point, we're gonna have a big screen in the, in, the, in the new Chabad house. We'll have a big screen and we'll project it on the wall as well. We'll be able to see Rashi as well. But in any case, what does Rashi say on 60? I'm sure it says it in English in the art school as well, but here you have Rashi's words exactly. And not 60, 60, 64, um, uh, no, for 63. What does Rashi say? What do they say here on 63? It must, it must be how the art school would say it. 63, okay, don't have, um, Yes, yes, yes. You see on, on, on 120 on the bottom where it says 63. But Rashi says like this. Rashi says, the suach is an expression of prayer. As in Psalms, he pours out his prayer, sicho. 
So the Suha coming to speak, but Rashi says in the Bible, to speak means to pray to God. So we know Yitzchak, where he was coming from. He was coming from, he was coming from coming, he was coming from coming to the well. He was coming from coming to the well. I know that sounds strange, but that's what the verse says. He was coming from coming to the well, and he was, he was living in the south. And then he goes out to pray in the field, and he lifts up his eyes, verse 63, and he lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, camels were approaching. Rebecca lifted her eyes and saw Isaac, and she let herself down from the camel. That's a nice translation. Literally, vatipol. Vatipol means she fell off the camel. Well, Rashi says it doesn't mean she fell off, right? Rashi says she slipped off toward the earth. In other words, when you say tipol, it sounds like accident, right? Rashi makes it, says no. It doesn't mean she fell by mistake. She got tripped. She's on the camel. It means she uh, intentionally slipped down off the camel. She said, it says she inclined. She, oh, so that's where Rashi continues. As a targum kinat, and she leaned. She leaned toward the earth, but did not reach the ground. As above verse 14, please lower your pitcher, which a targum renders arkini, similar to this. In other words, Rashi is saying the word batipol, um, um, to fall, doesn't mean necessarily falling. It means she bows toward the ground. And Rashi's proof is because the targum uses the term arkinat, ar ar which is like the same term where same term he uses, the, the Aramaic translation, the same term where he uses where Rebecca, where, he, where the, the servant asks Rebecca to take off her, pitch, her pitcher from her shoulder and give him water. And when it says we take the pitcher down, you don't throw it onto the floor, right? You lower it down a little bit. So she lowers it down. But the verse says she fell. And Rashi sort of softens the fall, pun intended. It says, no, he didn't fall. She leaned toward the ground. Okay, fine. Um, the story continues, verse 65, <clears throat> and she said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field toward us? And the servant said, he is my master. And she took the veil and covered herself. Okay, this is very interesting because this is the source why we cover uh, the bride at the chuppah with the veil. The only place we get it from Rebecca. But it's interesting that the commentators point out this was not the custom of women in... <clears throat> The Middle East at the time. Women in the Middle East cover themselves as they still do many times. Here, she was not covered. She only covered when she saw her master. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But in any case, the verse continues, and the servant told Isaac all that he had done. And Isaac brought her to, her to the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he took Rebekah. She became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted for the loss of his mother. So that's the story of the meeting. After spending, this is a very long chapter. Chapter, this chapter has 67 verses, which is pretty long for a chapter. So most of the chapter was how Eliezer finds Rebecca, how he convinces her family to let her go, convinces her family to let her go with him immediately. And the meeting, you have a few verses. And finally, this chapter, Mazel Tov, we had the marriage, not only the marriage, but also the comfort. And everybody lives happily ever after, at least for the next couple of minutes. But in any case, we want to focus this morning on the meeting what was Isaac going? Where was he coming from? What was he doing? Why do they meet in such a strange way? Why does she fall off the camel? Whatever that means, fall or tilt. What does this tell us about the nature of that relationship? What does it tell us about Isaac? What does it tell us about Isaac's state of mind? So that is the, the uh, pieces of the puzzle that we want to try to put together. Uh, of course, comments, questions, uh, theories, always, always welcome. A question, Rabbi. Yes. So it, it said that Rebecca had maidens. So that would, to me, that would elude. I missed the word. Rebecca had what? Maidens. Yes, Venarotea, yes. Okay, so she probably came from a family of prominence. Yes. Where, where, where she had attendance. Yeah. And it's, I just think that's another interesting component to the story. Yes, um, uh, Abraham himself was from a prominent family. His father, Terah, his father Terah was one of the servants of the King Nimrod, one of the ministers of King Nimrod. Um, Abraham, of course, rebelled against the family and escaped the father, escaped Nimrod. But at some point, the father rejoined, we believe, and we believe the father did Teshuvah. That's what Rashi said in Before Lech Lecha. And I guess they could preserve some of their wealth. And some of that is passed on to Abraham's brother, Nachor, and then passed on to the, his children. 
which is just one follow-up question yeah. when, when they talk about 10 months for a year yeah were these people using a 10-month calendar at that time not necessarily i just think 10, 10 months would mean always a year i don't know i don't know the answer to that question but i said no, i don't think it's necessarily but it's possible i don't know I don't thank know. you well they said 10 months and 12 months yeah, no, they said Yamim yeah, days or 10. So Rashi explains that days can mean years in biblical Hebrew. Yamim yeah, days could be a year. And then 10, if it's less than a year, can't mean 10 years. So it's logical that it means 10 days. So there's a lot of, you know, in, biblical, in, in times of the Talmud, for example, then, you know, the, the, the ancient world, if you betrothed the woman, to be, to betroth the land and the, and the wedding did not happen on the same moment. We today, we do it together. At the chuppah, we give the ring, which is the betrothal, and we do the, the blessings of marriage, the chuppah, which is the culmination of the betrothal, of the nisuin, the second half, I should say. Um, the engagement that we do today doesn't have any legal um, force from the perspective of halacha, because once a woman is engaged or betrothed, she is considered married, and she would need a divorce. So that's why we don't do it. Well, why, why would you wait 10 months and then you'll need a divorce and it becomes complicated. But in biblical, in, in biblical times, and even, even in, in the times of the Mishnah and the Talmud, the, these events happen 10 months apart or a year apart. And I don't remember everything offhand now, and maybe I should know, but the bottom line is, if a person betrothes a woman after a certain point, he has to support her. That's one of the obligations of the Ketubah. What happens if um, one of them don't want to consummate, they want to delay the marriage? Right. So then it depends. It depends how much they want to delay. And if it's delayed beyond the normal custom, then the man would not have to support the woman after that time until she comes to his home. Right. Let's say they're betrothed and the, and the woman says, OK, I don't want to get married in a year. I want to get married in five years. I have to finish my graduate degree. Right. So he can't force her to marry, but he could say, well, the obligations of the ketubah will not kick in until you until until we get married. Right, so so there was a set time that was considered normal to prepare a year, twelve months, whatever whatever it is, ten months a year, even in biblical times. And you have, to, and if you want to marry, you have to give you a year notice. So we're betrothed already. So legally, we're met, legally you can't marry anybody else. Put it to you that way, right? And if there is, for example, adultery, that's considered uh, adultery with a married woman. You know the the severe ramifications. But the bottom line is, but the, we weren't married yet. We only had the first step, not the second step. So, the, but if you want to, if you want to go to the second step, you have to give a notice, twelve months. And after that twelve months, if one of them don't want to, let's say the man doesn't want, to, he wants to go to graduate school. So, okay, you don't want to, no problem. But you still have to support your, I don't want to say wife, but I guess wife, right? So, so there is, there was this thing where you have time to prepare, but that time doesn't, it doesn't can last forever. If you, if you, I mean, it could last forever, but the obligations would would, would be affected. So that, that, that's what Lavan and but, but, uh, her brother and her mother say, look, we gotta be, be, we are happy to do this marriage, but let's wait a year, you know, or maybe close to a year. And he insists, no, well, don't you see that this is directly from Hashem? Let's not waste any time. And eventually they're persuaded. Um, so that's the, the issue of a year. Um, what, what, how they, what does, it, could that, does that imply that a 10 month calendar? I don't know. I, I hard for me, uh, a sore, I don't know, I don't know. That's the right answer because I don't know. So if I told you I knew and I gave you an answer, that could be the wrong answer. But the fact that I don't know, that is correct. Okay, let's deal with what's happening here. Is let's deal with what's happening here. Um, let's start with the first point. Let's start with the second point. What a what a strange way. What an unromantic way. This is a romantic way to describe a, ma a a meeting. She sees him. She's in awe. She falls off the camel. Okay, you want to weaken it? You want to say? Uh, you want to say that that she doesn't fall off, she tilts, she bends. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm not going to disagree. It's very romantic. Maybe it's the American. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see if I can make the question a little harder. That would be, we want to give you a hard time. Um, she covered and she took a veil and covered herself. Why did she cover herself? So, you could say modesty, but you can also say maybe she was, there was a certain feeling of shame. In other words, embarrassment, because basically what I'm trying to get to is it looks like that she was in awe of him. Instead of, you would think of a closeness or a friendship or a love, it looks like there's more of an awe, right? The, the Torah portrays, they're riding on the camel, she sees him. And for me, second Seth, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not I'm, I just wanna make my point. Um, 
right? So it seems like, oh, let's read Rashi, 64. And Rebecca lifted her eyes and saw Isaac and she let herself down from the camel. We know what the Hebrew says, she fell off the camel, says Rashi. She saw his majestic appearance and she was astounded by him, okay? So you're not gonna see this in a Hollywood film in the last hundred years, right? This is not the way you would think of a romantic relationship, at least from my at least at least the way I can tell, is that one party is in awe of the other. And that's what it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if Seth, I'm happy to take other, no, I'm just listening. we are, we're not, you know, this is a, this is a democracy. Everybody has their a right to their opinion. Um, so, so we want to hear actually everybody's opinion. But it seems to be saying that that uh, that you have this sense of awe, and she's probably young. I'm not going to tell you what the sages say because it's a little bit creepy. But the sages say I think that the, you know at, the, at least when they met, she was very young. Some some medrash is three years old. Others disagree. But she is relatively young. Um, he is already uh, at least 37. He is a spiritual person. He is was on the on, on the on the on the Mount Moriah. He is an introvert. He is um, dignified, and she sees him, and she's in awe. That's what it seems is what's happening here. And the question is, is that is that uh, is that is that good? Is that bad? How does this how does this impact the story? And what do we make of this? So we ahead. are in awe when we say <clears throat> yeah. one of the things about our relationship with Hashem is we're supposed to love with all your heart and your soul. Right. And we're in awe. We have both and elements, Hashem. correct. So that is a form of love. That's a form of, form of the relationship. So fell in love right away. Oh, so let's so let, good point. Let me elaborate on this. First of all, I want to say that you reminded me that Isaac just finished praying. When you have a spiritual person just finished praying, he's even more more or inspiring. Right, guy didn't just come back from the pool. Right, he came back from praying. So he he's, he he seems more spiritual. Right, so that's part of the awe that she senses, and that's why Rashi says Yitzchak is coming, Isaac is coming from supplicating in the field, right, Play, praying in the field, and he's more spiritual. Okay, uh, um, um, Seth says, look, our relationship with God has both awe and love. So. She falls in love and she's in awe, not a contradiction. Correct. But that leads me to the Kabbalistic interpretation. The Kabbalistic interpretation is that the three patriarchs, each one represents another emotion. And Abraham was clearly in love with God. God refers to him as the one who loved me. You see clearly he's in love with God. He's not so much in awe of God. When he has to argue with God, he does. He, I mean, he, I'm sure he had some awe, but that was not the dominant feature of the relationship between Abraham and God. The dominant emotion was love. And Isaac, according to the Kabbalah, the dominant Feature was awe. Of course, he loved God, but his relationship was based on awe. And that was his personality. And therefore, it's not surprising that his personality, his relationship with God, also influenced his interpersonal relationship. Now, the most romantic verse in the entire Torah is about Isaac. What, is the, what does the verse say? I read it to you, so, so uh, you, 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 I'm not trying to hide it, right? What does the verse say? The most romantic verse in the Torah is just a, a little bit later, verse 67. And Isaac brought her to the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Doesn't say it about Abraham. I'm sure they loved each other. Doesn't say it, right? Doesn't say it about Adam and Eve. Doesn't say it about Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah, not about, uh, it does say about Isaac. Oh, I'm sorry, not the most romantic, second to most. Later, when, when Jacob reads Rachel, it's another whole level. But it's a very beautiful, he's crying, but he kisses her, he's crying. No, but that, ver it does say he loved her. Uh, I don't even know if it says the word love. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I don't know. I have to check. He uh, he, he wanted to make his mother happy. Mother passed and, away, but yeah, he wanted. Yeah, yeah but he still. That yeah. was his. Doesn't matter. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, when somebody passes away, then after a while, you can think about yes, it. Yes. Yes. And you see how much you really have to make them happy. Right. Um, so. So you're saying that it was love, and he had love. Well, no, cool. no. After he appeased his mother, then he realized how great she was to help, right. help him do be the... Right. So we'll deal with the mother in a minute because I'm sure Freud will have a good time on this. The same verse. He loves his yeah. wife. He loves his mother. Boy, yeah. we'll, we'll, this will have, we'll have a good time with that, hopefully in a few minutes. But even before that, 
I'm not saying Isaac was not capable of love. The only person that the Torah says clearly loved his wife. I mean, you don't have to say it. It's I obvious. Say that. I just no, I'm saying, I'm saying that. So it's obviously capable of love. But according to the Kabbalah, the dominant feature of his relationship with God is awe. And therefore, at least the way the sages are saying when she says, when, when she's, when, is well, it fear? It's not, fear awe. is not awe. Awe okay. is when you, well, fear is you're afraid. Awe is you're respectful. In other words, you realize you see you come in the face of greatness. You're not afraid. Afraid means I'm afraid how it's going to affect me. But in all, when you see something greater than yourself, you become more humble. And it's not about you. It's being about the person you're seeing or the thing you're seeing. Whereas love, it's about how I feel. I feel close to you. When I'm in awe, I don't sense myself. I sense the other. Was Isaac in awe of, of, of God? Of Rebecca? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says that she wasn't. She, it seems again, assuming that Rashi is correct, that when it says that she covered, uh, what does Rashi say again? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Sunday morning. I'm not. No, I, I still have. I still have caffeine in my cup, which is a problem because it should be in what the, in my cup. When you say Yiddish, a cup is a head. So the caffeine is in the wrong cup. It's in the cup, but not in the cup. Um, so, yeah, what does Rashi say? Rashi says that she saw Isaac and she fell off the camel, says Rashi in 64. She saw his majestic appearance and she was astounded by him. Doesn't say anywhere that he fell on the floor, right? So it seems that his relationship, it's a little bit of an imbalance in the sense that he's majestic, he's spiritual, he's awe-inspiring. She is in awe of him. She covers his her face. Doesn't mean he's a bad guy. Doesn't mean he's not capable of love. He does love her. Um, Torah says so explicitly. Maybe I'm just thinking now, maybe the Torah has to say it because you may think he didn't, because you may think it's only about awe. Everybody else, you don't have to say Abraham loves Sarah. Obviously, Abraham is all just a, a walking love machine. You know, he's just love, uh, just love all the time. But here, Isaac, you may think, like the Kabbalah says, that he's all about awe. So you say, don't worry, he loved his wife. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. So the bottom line is, but it seems like there's a certain imbalance here with the awe issue. And um, there's a commentator, and it's Sivan Balajan. 19th century commentator. He was a Rosh Yeshiva of Elijah. He was the first one, uh, first Rosh Yeshiva, first to teach to teach the Bible in the Yeshiva, because the Yeshiva was a place for studying Talmud and Jewish law. But he said we had to teach Bible in the in the Torah and basically starting the 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 uh, starting the applying the Talmudic analysis to the study of, of, of Chumash. Many people did it after him, but he was that was uh, an interesting an interesting uh, interesting development in the Yeshiva world. But in any case, he says like this, he says, what is the one problem that people are, what, what is the one strange thing that you see about the relationship about Isaac and Rebecca? And that is that when Isaac, the next Parsha, when Isaac later, years later, 60 years later, uh, 64 years later, I think, yeah, 64 years later, when Isaac wants to bless his sons, he wants to bless Esau, and Rebecca wants him to bless Jacob, so she tells Jacob to trick her father, her trick his father, and instead of doing what you would expect a spouse to do is go have a conversation with your husband. That's what we would expect. And that's what Sarah and Abraham do. They also fight. They also argue. Sarah says, throw Hagar out of the house. Abraham doesn't want to. God says, do so anyway. But you have a problem. You have, you're not sure what to do. You talk about it. Here, Rebecca is using trickery. Now, why does she do that? We'll get to that. But believe me, we'll have plenty to talk about some people so there's no there are different interpretations there are different interpretations why you would do that and some of them are very beautiful one interpretation is says in its eve you have to understand that their relationship was based on this meeting was telling not only for that first meeting but it's telling about their relationship in general she was in awe of him that's just their relationship so she could not come to him and say i think you're wrong i think you're doing something wrong because that was not the nature of their relationship so why is it so important to know right here, how they met. I don't know that we have to know if we're right here. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe it's a nice piece of information. But what's practical about this information? The Torah is not just giving mm -hmm. us information for no reason, just to make the story more interesting, right? But what the Nitziv is saying, you cannot understand the story later with Rebecca telling Jacob to trick her, his father, her husband. Instead of talking to him, you cannot understand that unless you understand that Isaac was an awe-inspiring person. When you looked at him, especially after he prayed, but when you looked at him, this, he was all inspiring. You would fall off the camel. And, 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 and that did not wear off after six decades of marriage. So of course there was love, but don't expect, don't expect, and, and Abraham did not inspire that love. And neither did Jacob from uh, that awe. 
Abraham didn't inspire that all from his spouse and neither did Jacob. So we're not saying this is the way marriage should be. No, we're saying this is, in fact, we're saying that there was probably a negative side effect in the sense that she had, they had to use trickery. Like I said, there were other interpretations. This is just one. But it's interesting, to, by, by taking this view, you see how this meeting is telling you about the relationship. It's not just about the meeting, it's about the nature of the relationship. And that allows us to understand the later story where um, she can't approach him and say, I think you're making a mistake. Why? Not because spouses shouldn't do that. Spouses should. But in that case, this relationship with Isaac would be something that was difficult to do. Go ahead, Seth. If she were in awe of him, she would tell him the truth because she would not. She knew he was a very holy person. And you don't lie to a holy person or you don't lie to anybody. She was in fear of him because she was afraid that, you know, her coming to him and telling him to do a bad thing, a, a false thing. Now, she was telling her husband that he's making a mistake by loving the older son. But she was afraid. She was afraid to do that. So I, 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 you have, you have now full permission to. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's no. A, I, if you I, love somebody and you're in awe of them, you would tell them or, the or, truth because no. they would make the right decision. Look, Seth, I, I, you're, in, I, I, I think you, your position is legitimate. I, my position is a little bit different. It's not right. No, I didn't say that. My <laughs> position is a little bit different. Instead of saying or, I'm going to say. I'm, instead of saying fear, I'm going to say or. Or is also no. You would not go to someone you're in awe of and saying. I think you're making a mistake. The whole idea of awe is you see, the, you see the other person as in some way much greater than yourself and you very small in their presence. And if you're in awe, the one thing you would not do is say, you know, I think you're making a mistake. If you're in love, you could say that. So if she thinks he's not making a mistake, why? No, she thinks he does making a mistake. The question is if she'll tell it to him. Yeah, it's but if she's to... in awe, he would not be making a mistake. She thinks mind. he's making a mistake but it's still hard to approach the person that you're in awe of and okay. say in their presence, they're awe-inspiring. You still have your own opinion. You could think that he's <clears throat> making a mistake, but to come up to someone you're in awe of and say, my friend, you're making a mistake, even if I think so, right? Who's someone I'm in awe of? I don't know. Let's say someone is in awe of the president of the United States. Let's say, I'm not, not this president or the past president. Let's say someone is in awe of a president of the United States. It's very likely that I don't agree with the president, but it's very likely that if I'm in the Oval Office, it's going to be very hard for me, unless I'm not, very hard for me to come say, look him in the eye and say, you know, I think you're making a big mistake. I think, I think you're a fool. I think you're making bad policy. Very easy for me to say it. Okay. It's very easy for me to sit in my basement and say, it. even I think you're making a mistake. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. People meet the president, they're, they're silenced for the most part, unless you, unless you have some experience doing so. So I'm just, not that I'm in awe of the, not that you should be in awe of the president. I'm just saying okay. the office of the presidency. When I'm distant, I could say, look, I disagree with the guy. But to approach him but when he's awe-inspiring, correct. But to approach the guy and say, you're wrong. And your estimation and, and the deep relationship that you have with your son is predicated on a mistake and your son is misleading you. <clears throat> that's something that's hard to do. Could be hard to do. I'm not saying it's the only interpretation. There are many interpretations. But I'm just saying by this interpretation, what's so beautiful is that it tells you that the verse here is, is, is telling us this bit of information because it's telling us about the nature of the relationship of, the, of their marriage. And that will help you understand the story in the future. Otherwise, it's very hard to understand. This does not mean this is the way a relationship should look, right? Because that's it wasn't the relationship of the other patriarchs. This is a relationship, not the proper relationship. But this was their relationship. And that's why they responded in a certain way. And if you had no, if, if the Torah was the same, just took out this meeting of how she falls, she's in awe of him and she falls off the camel, you, you, you come to the next parasha, you're like, what's going on here? This is strange. So this story helps us understand the other story. And that's why whenever you look at some other people and you have questions, you have to first think about what is the nature of their, their, their relationship? What is it predicated upon? What's the balance of, what's the, what's the communication like? What's the relationship like? And then you'll be able to understand to get a fuller picture. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, no, Seth, I think like, oh, I think maybe we get a little hung up on this. Oh, you know, when you're oh, you're like, you're like mesmerized. You're like, your jaw is dropped. You like, you're kind of like speechless. You're, you're just, you're more just like focusing on the other person and you don't really have a heck of a lot to say. Right. Especially in their presence. I could, when, I, when, I, when I'm sitting in my basement, I could say, look, I think you're totally wrong. But to approach someone who's a great person, a man of stature, you, you, I, I think you're, you're, I think you're, 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 
you're making a mistake, but it takes a lot of courage, right? If you work in the company and you walk up to the CEO and you think he's making a mistake, right? But it's, 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 just, it's just not so easy to go up to him and say, you know, I think you're making a mistake. But at the same time, just make it a reference. Yeah. So make it somebody like, <clears throat> you know, not a second right, or like right, person right. that you really are in love because you feel like Hashem is yeah. flowing through them. Yeah. I don't know if you would trick them. I think you would cater. So that's a different question. That's a different you question. Say, I, you have, I, I kind of say my opinion has to dwarf compared to yours. You have a greater wisdom than I do, and I'm just not going to. That's that's typical what happens. So that's actually interesting about Rebecca that she does not, in the face of the all, she does not give up her own perspective and her persistence and to do what she thinks is right in the face of in the face of that great awe. So maybe what that does is actually highlights the balance that even when you're in the presence of a great person, you have to maintain, or at least Rebecca maintained her own identity and individuality and perspective. And it's easy to cave. It's hard to do what you think, to do what's do what you think is right in the face of somebody who is great. Now, people who are great doesn't mean they don't make mistakes. When we get to that story, you see Jacob maybe Isaac maybe made the mistake because of his greatness, right? When you have when you're great, you have certain blind uh, blind spots, right? Well, Someone who's not as great, someone who's <laughs> as great could 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 see those blind spots, right? But it's a beautiful, so it's, so it's very interesting. You're right. Very interesting. She's in awe. She doesn't just erase her own opinion. She has her opinion. She insists that Jacob does it. Jacob doesn't want to do it. He's afraid. Jacob himself is afraid, and she encourages him. Um, so so that so that's very interesting. She could maintain her own perspective. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I, I think the operative word is think. There's, there's a distinct difference between saying to somebody, you made a mistake, or I think you made a mistake. Right, right. Because, because one, is a, a, one is just expressing your own thought. Right. And perhaps, you know, giving the other person an opportunity to deliberate about what your thought is, right. as opposed to actually correcting them. Right. But even that, I think that, that that's more of expected when, 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 when the two people in the relationship see each other as on the same plane, right? In other words, more or less in the same plane. We have different perspectives, but we're, 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 we're in a, a marriage that is, uh, for lack of a better term, equal. Mm -hmm. But if she viewed her, herself and him as not on the same plane, she, viewed, she was in awe of him. She viewed him, viewed him as he was, an intensely spiritual person even more so than Abraham and Jacob in some ways. In other words, his ability to be totally spiritual, unlike Abraham, who was spiritual, loved God, but he was directed toward other people and feeding people. He was in the hospitality business, right? He wasn't that awe-inspiring. To the contrary, he was outgoing and inclusive and always trying to make people feel comfortable, right? So it's not, a, it's not saying one is greater than the other. It's a different personality trait. And with Isaac, Isaac was awe-inspiring. She did not see him and her as on the same spiritual level, and she was in awe. Now, this is, doesn't mean this is a healthy relationship or for everybody. This is descriptive of what okay. their relationship was like. Why is it so important to know? Because I have to know how what their love like, life looked like. I know she loved her. It's important. It's good information. But according to the Nitziv, you need this bit of information to be able to understand the next Parsha, and that's why it's here. So this is her... Modus operandi. Correct. It's not only telling about the meeting, it's indicative about it's indicative about their relationship. Because when the Torah gives you a precious few incidents about <clears> your <throat> life, and if this is one of them, then you have to understand the Torah is not telling you a one-time event. The Torah is telling you an example, but an example that's telling about the relationship as a whole. Okay, we're spending way too much time on this. Uh, Vicky, please go ahead. I, we gotta we gotta pack in more info because then you're gonna. We're going to come after an hour and say only one one idea, not enough. So we're going to hear Vicky's question, and then we're going to try to pull forward a little bit. Go ahead, Vicky. Uh, thank you. Um, I just uh, I also didn't want to spend much time on it, but um, I think what clarifies the difference between awe and fear is that particular nature of relationship. Because if Rebecca was indeed fearful of Isaac, she wouldn't do what she did. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. So, so, so. But because it, and, and it's perfectly healthy to be in awe of somebody and at the same time loving him. Yeah, I, I don't know. So, so let's start with the first point. I think what you're saying is similar to what Amy is saying in the sense that, in other words, connected to that theme. In other words, in other words, the fact that she does not lose her own identity and, and still able to, to, to uh, 
disagree with their husband, make a plan and pursue the plan, right? Is not is more of a sign of awe than a fear. That granted, is this a healthy form of relationship? Uh, is it healthy? Uh, I, I, hard for me to say that that relationship where where they're not communicating is the is the is the best form of the relationship unless you take other approaches. There are other approaches that say explain why she didn't communicate as a in that specific situation. And they say that was actually the, the more kind and compassionate thing to do, but we'll get to that later. Assuming this is the case, assuming she is in awe to the extent that they cannot communicate, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the best, you know, this is the, the model of a relationship. I think that when you come to the other, the other patriarchs, it's much more human in the sense that- Years distant. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, was different. Yeah. But you're talking about 40 years distance between the contact and the, if you want to call it, an offense. Right. And people in a relationship change. Um, my oh, wife told me right. in awe. My wife <laughs> told me in awe when we first got married. Right. And even though she still holds me in awe, <laughs> we have an equal relationship where yes. I would hope where she can deceive me and feel confident in doing it There's i would say ken i would say like this what i would say is like this you looking at your relationship because you're looking at all the richness of this of the, of the multi multi-decade relationship the torah writing the the narrative chooses to tell us precious little about isaac so imagine we have a relationship and we say two stories story number one you're writing a book and you're saying two stories no, story number one woman was in awe of her husband Story number two, six days, decades later, woman disagrees with her husband. Instead of speaking to him, she tricks him. Okay, now, of course, a lot of things develop, but we don't know, the Torah doesn't choose to tell us about those things. So we have to look at what was their relationship like? That's interesting thing, uh, you know, to imagine, you know, if I had to write a movie and I had to fill up those 60 years, what would I fill it up with? Okay, that's a nice exercise. But another exercise is to think about, what does the Torah want me to feel about this relationship? By only giving me these two nuggets of information, it gives us a little bit more, but just to dramatize it, assuming the, assuming the Torah just told us these two events. So by the Torah only giving this information and withholding everything else as irrelevant, so maybe what the Torah is telling us is that unlike usually when you're in awe and then it passes, but if you're in awe of a deeply spiritual person, that awe persists. Maybe, but you have to think about what is the Torah telling me? I know my imagination, human imagination fills in things between the lines. You say, of course, it was the summer. We think they didn't go on vacation. I think they didn't sit in the hammock together. Of course they did. Yes, but the Torah is not telling that to us. And maybe the Torah wants to give us the impression and say, Rebecca and Isaac, when you think about Rebecca and Isaac, what image should pop in your head? He's walking. He just finished praying. He's intensely spiritual. She's falling off the camel. Keep that image in your head. Let that paint everything else you're going to read about them, because first of all, you're not going to read much else about them, but that will help you understand the dynamic of the relationship. But her seed. I'm sorry? It, the understanding was that her seed was going to create generations with Abraham. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that right. stayed with her for 60 years. Yes. And so if that's in her mind, and she's going along thinking this all along, and then all of a sudden, my husband's handmaiden is going to give the blessing of the future to this bastard child, excuse the expression. Well, I would do anything to change that. Right. Yeah, and I agree. So that's, that's, that's just clarify. There's a little bit difference here. It wasn't, it wasn't a Yishmael. It wasn't the bastard. It wasn't the, the, the son of the maidservant. It wasn't the bastard anyway. But the bottom line is this is the twins. They're both were Rebecca's sons, right? We're talking about the next generation, Isaac has with Rebecca. But I get your point. The point is she's very careful about the legacy. I agree. Now, because I agree with you, I'll say, so go take him for coffee and go talk to him. Mm -hmm. Right? Why in heaven do you have to send your son to trick his father? It just doesn't sound Maybe right. Maybe she knew he wasn't going to give in. Maybe. That could be. That's a possible interpretation. She thought, you know. Seth, is, when we. He's much older than her. When we get there, we're going to give all the possible interpretations, and some of them are very convincing, and some of them are very beautiful. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's one of the romant most romantic scenes in the Torah, where you don't want to step in and destroy the love between a father and a son, even if you think the son is undeserving. So we can talk about that when we get there. Try to do the best for Israel. Yeah, we can. We can talk about. We can talk about that later. I'm just saying. Let, let's take the simple meaning, the one possible interpretation. 
I'm not saying it's the only one. One possible interpretation is that when the Torah, and it's interesting to me, not only because of this interpretation, because this help, teaches us how to learn the Torah. When the Torah gives us a story which seems to be not that relevant, understand that the relevance may not be for this page, the relevance may be for, to give you the bigger picture of everything else that's going on. So in that sense, it's an inter interesting thing, way to think about stories in the Torah in general. So again, I, I, I retract, this is not the only, inter I didn't retract, I said this earlier again, but I reiterate, this is not the only interpretation, this is a possible interpretation. And that is that this encounter is actually colors and affects their entire relationship. And this helps us understand the future. Okay, whoever wants to disagree with me about this point, in 11 minutes. Yeah, yeah. This is not about that. Yes, go ahead. I wonder how she feels about herself telling her husband a falsehood. How does she, right. do you have any insight into that? I wonder how she felt about it. Maybe my guess is she sees it as the lesser of two evils. I don't think she thinks it's a great thing. Uh, certainly, Rebe Isaac doesn't want to do it. Uh, Rebecca, his son, Jacob doesn't want to do it. She says, the curse will be upon me if anything goes wrong. In other words, she, sense, she senses that this is uh, morally questionable and a curse is befitting. And she says, I'll take the blame, I'll take the fall. So she's clearly understands that this is, uh, this is not uh, the preferred option. But I think that we always, in human, humans have to make a distinction between what is good and what is the best situation of the two situations that lie before me. So in other words, what's the lesser of the two evils? So that's the most I can say right now on this question. Okay, so now we know verse what? Now we know we just discussed verse, um, we just discussed verse 65. Um, we didn't discuss, we didn't discuss verse 64. Verse, verse 62. Verse 62 is an absolutely fascinating verse. 62. Now Rashi helps us and gives us some insight, but I think Rashi doesn't need some help. Rashi relies on us to fill in the missing pictures. This, if you had to paint the scene here, you can actually get creative. This is actually very interesting. So let's read 65. 62. This is a crazy story. Oh my God. This is, this, I, don't, I, I don't know what to do with this. I'll be honest with you. I have no idea. It's 1021. I have no idea where we're going to end up at 1030. I'm being very honest. So I just want to put out a few pieces of the puzzle and then hopefully everybody together could take this where they want to go and where you want to run with this. But let's read verse 62. Isaac was on his way. Or literally, Isaac was coming from coming from the air Lachai Roi. Um, and he dwelt in the land of the south. So Rashi does not address the first point I want to address. What does it mean Isaac was coming from coming from Be'er Lachai Roi? Okay, first thing we're going to say is that coming from coming means he always would come from there. In other words, Isaac always goes to that well. So when the Torah says Isaac was coming from coming, what you say is he was always coming. That's what he would do. He would go to the well and he was coming from the well. That was a normal, it wasn't like once, it's once, once upon a time he, he crossed this well and he, by chance he's coming from this place. No, he was constantly, he would constantly come to and from this well. When they met, he was coming from where? From where he usually is coming, right? So that's the, that's the grammar um, where you have the verb it's called makor, makor in biblical Hebrew. So there is an equivalent in English. I just forget what it is. Uh, my grammar teacher will have to forgive me. But when you have a verb that's written in the source form, in other words, like bo, ba is the verb. Yitzchak is coming. From coming, from coming. So coming is the, is the verb in, the, in, the, in, the, in Hebrew. It's a source form, which means you constantly come. So it's not describing a specific action. It's not a specific verb, but it's the concept of coming, which means, and you do that when it's continuous. So Yitzchak is coming from coming, because that's where he always comes. He always goes to the well. What's the well? Be'er lachai ro'i. The well, chai is the living one, ro'i, who sees me. What do we know about this well? So before we do the well, let's read Rashi. Coming from Be'er lachai ro'i, says Rashi, quotes the Medrash, where he had gone to bring Hagar to Abraham, his father, that he should marry her. What's happening here? What's happening here is we know decades earlier, Abraham sent away Hagar. Why does Abraham send away Hagar? Because Rebecca, because Sarah tells him to, and he doesn't want to. And God says, whatever Sarah does, tell her. And that's what he does. Now hear about the story. Isaac is obviously loyal to his mother. And his mother doesn't want Hagar in the home. Now his mother died. 
Now he's torn between his loyalty to his mother and to his father. Because his father, he, 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 he's trying to make a shidduch between who? Between her, his father and Hagar. He wants his father to remarry Hagar, who was sent away but because of what his mother said. Isaac's mother. So this is a tricky situation. So Rashi says he went. It wasn't by accident. He went to go and, and, and bring Hagar to his father. And Medrash says, well, he says he knew Eliezer is going to get a wife for him. So he says, I should be married and my father should not. My father also needs a spouse. Who should be the spouse? Hagar, of course. But I'm just saying, it's, it's interesting that, again, I'm still putting out the pieces of the puzzle. Seth will comment in a minute. But Seth, in the end, last, later on, the last verse of this chapter, talks about how he's comforted about his mother. So obviously, you see there's a very deep bond between him and his mother. And he sees his love to his wife as comforting him for, his, for, for, the, for, the, for the loss of his mother. So he sees his relationship with his mother um, continuing through the relationship with his wife. So he obviously is, is very much connected to his mother and her legacy. On the other hand, he's bringing Hagar back. So the sages say she did tshuva. We'll deal with that later. But the bottom line is just a fascinating concept. Now, where's the well? So if you go back to the story of Hagar, when Hagar was sent away, when she was sent away, she almost died. It was the thirst. And what happened? The angel of God appears to Hagar. We're at the well. Uh, what's the well call, called? Okay, don't take it from me. We're going to find it inside so I don't make any mistakes. Oh, so there's two wells. The first time and the second time. The first time the, the angel report, um, appeared to uh, appeared to him. Um, there, I think it's called the Er Lachai if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, beautiful. Look at page. If you want to look at chapter 16, and the art school is page 73. We're gonna we're gonna find it in here because it's too good not, not not to look at. So this is chapter. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. Right, he was sent away. She goes and and she and she, and and uh, and she gets. She goes and verse seven, chapter 16, page 73 in the art scroll. Verse seven. Well, well, it's really 71 in the art scroll. If you want to start at seven. Um, angel of the Lord found her by the water fountain in the desert and, the uh, and by the fountain on the road to Shur. He says, where are you going? She says, I'm running away from Sarah. He says, go back. In verse 11, she says, and the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall name him Yishmael, for the Lord has heard his affliction, etc." Verse 13, and she called the name of the Lord, meaning the angel who had spoken to her, you are the God of seeing, because she said, have I seen him here also after I have seen? In other words, she's referring to God as the God who sees. Why? Even after I have seen God in the house of Abraham, I also see God here in my time of affliction. So she said, refers to God as the God who sees, because in those, in those, in those areas, you know, in those days, people thought of God as transcendent. She says, no, this is the God who sees my pain. Okay, next verse, verse 13, 14. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lachai Ro'i. Behold, it is between Kadesh and between Bered. So this well is called the well, Lachai, to the living one who sees. So it's clear that when it says that Isaac is coming back from the well of Lachai Roi, and we say he was constantly going back and forth, Isaac would go there to pray. This is the place where God appeared to Hagar. This is the place where people understood that God sees the person in, in, in affliction. Okay. Now it's fascinating. Rashi says he went to go back. Go, he went to go and find a wife for his for his father. How does Rashi know it? Well, Rashi later we know his father remarried a few verses later, but in the next chapter. But how do you know that Isaac was involved? And how do you know that that at this point that's where he was coming from? So the point here is by mentioning the well. The well is where Hagar saw the angel, and it was in the desert where Hagar lived. So we assume that Hagar is in the area. So if he's going back, he's going to bring them both together. So what's happening here is this fascinating concept, which I'm not, I don't have what to say about this. I'm just putting it out here. In the midst of his loyalty to his mother, and he's deeply connected to his mother, he's also thinking about what's, what his father and what his father needs. And what his father needs is Hagar, because we see that Hagar repented. But, but the bottom line is he's bringing them back together. And therefore, where he's going, he's going first of all, he's coming. So Rashi, we know two things. We know he's coming from praying. Well, it makes sense that he would pray at that well. 
because that's the place where God appears to people. And that well was sort of a symbol or, or, a, or a, 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 a monument, I don't know what's the right word, a monument to the concept that here is a place where God appears to people and people are in, are in pain and sorrow. So that's where, you, when you say Isaac came from coming, he would always go there to pray. Well, so that's the first thing we know about it, place of prayer. Second thing we know about it, that's the place where Hagar is. And Isaac is going, for his marriage, he's going back to, um, he's going back to, to, the mar to, 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 to bring Hagar back to his father, even though that wasn't necessarily what his mother would have wanted, at least not at the time, but he's loyal to his mother, but also thinking about his father, her, his father's needs, which are not exactly the same, which is okay. And he could do both. And I think that is, that is something to contemplate and think about because um, usually um, parents, at least when they're in conflict, at least what they're conflict, what, at least when they're in conflict or in this area that they're in conflict about, they like to, to make you take sides. And here Isaac is not taking sides, so to speak. On one hand, he's very loyal to his mother and it's not his mother's in the past. He's living his relationship with his mother. He, he, he sees his mother, as we'll see later, he sees Re Rebecca as a continuation of his mother and his mother's legacy. And yet he's, his father needs what his father needs, which may be in conflict with his mother, which I think is something to think about and fascinating. What to do with this exactly, I don't know. But the good news is it's 10.30, so I can stop talking and I don't have to tell you what to do with this and you can write the end of the chapter on your own. Go ahead, Seth. When we go to pray. Yeah. He went to pray to ask God yeah. what the right thing Oh, very is. good. Very good. Because this was an emotionally difficult situation, because you he was know, balancing. So very good. Higher, Seth, beautiful. Uh, beautiful. Beautiful. Attention. Beautiful. Beautiful. You have to go to transcend yourself, to be able to do that, to be loyal to your mother and to see what your father needs, which may be in conflict with loyalty to your mother. You need to transcend self and get rid of your own ego and go beyond that. And Seth says, that's what he prayed for. I can only think, say that that's beautiful. And I, I wasn't there, but it sounds about you right know, to me. This is Isaac's fault, the whole thing. <laughs> he, it was not Rebecca. Was yeah, the good news is we're not, yeah, this is not a, this is not this a, is the Torah is not a document of giving out and saying, we, we, we read the story and then we distribute whose fault. The bottom line is, is our people, people have personalities. Every personality has certain pros and cons. In we other words, we miss this one point. Yeah. If, if Isaac respected Rebecca, it doesn't say he did. He said he loved her. If he respected yeah. her, then she would, he did this to himself. She, he didn't respect her. She didn't feel respected. And she probably didn't feel loved if she wasn't respected. And so she had a lie. That, 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 that is a very good point. That is a very good point. It's his own fault. If he was so great. It's a very good point. Maybe. I feel about great people. If he was so great, he would. Okay, I may get this barred for saying this. They may revoke my. They may. They may revoke my smicha. But what you're telling me is like this. What you're saying is that the fact that the awe, what we always say, the relationship has to have both awe and respect, both love and awe. But the fact that the awe was one way street and not both way, not a two way street, was a problem. And it would be Isaac's business. Should have been Isaac's business to find those areas in Rebecca which are not only love worthy but also awe inspiring. The problem with, it, with Isaac was he was very introverted and he was not, it was hard, you know, okay, I don't want to talk about the problems of Isaac, but it's, it, it's, it's no, it's, it's to think about someone who could be able to do that to find, I love somebody, Avi, there's no, I'm not, I, I, legitimately, spirit, from, the, from the perspective of spirituality, which is the only thing Isaac valued, from the perspective of spirituality, Isaac was superior, quote unquote, but there were other advantages that Rebecca was superior. And Rashi is going to say in the next parsha, he was the righteous, the son of the righteous, big deal. She was a righteous, the son, the, the son of a wicked, the daughter of a wicked. So in some ways, her righteousness um, surpasses his. So Seth is making a very good point. The Torah tells you he loved his wife. What the Torah is telling you also is that we don't see that he respected her or that he was in awe of her. So there was an imbalance. Maybe that was a problem. And Seth is saying, maybe that's the cause of the later tension in the family. I agree with you, Seth, you do, you're on a roll. When you, I just wanna, when you, it said, when you're studying um, Torah and when you're praying, except in one instance or two, you're supposed to say hello to, to somebody. the person yes. when somebody yes. says hello yes. to you, you're yes. supposed to, if you're really 
He's supposed to stop in, in the Amida, and he's the supposed to stop and respond. Yes, yes. Correct. Which means that that God, like, well, you see there with Abraham, Abraham leaves God's presence to invite the guests. The Talmud says, from here we see that inviting guests is more, is greater than greeting the divine presence. In other words, your relationship with other people should come before your relationship with God, because that's how you honor God, by honoring the spark of God, which is in every person. So, so, but, but, so that's honoring. So, but I I'm think- not trying to say bad God. No, no, no. It's not about a question of bad and good. It's a question of, of, it's a question of what we take away from the story. And maybe what we take away from the story is that it's very easy to fall in love. It's much harder to respect and especially harder to respect when some when, one of the, when, when regarding what, what Isaac values, which is spirituality, there really on the surface is no, he really is far more advanced than her and in that area. And he doesn't really see what to respect within her. That's maybe that's the problem. Maybe the problem is that you have to find not only areas why you love your spouse, but why you're in awe of them because you need that awe, you need that respect. And especially, and it has to be balanced, especially where he is so awe-inspiring that you have to have the balance and he has to find that within her. He probably, either he didn't do it or he didn't make her feel that he did that, which could be, could be he did, was in awe of her, but he didn't communicate that to her, which itself may be a problem. But again, we're not here to talk about who's blame and who's fault because it's not about fault. It's about understanding the dynamic of the relationship and understanding how that plays out in the next generation. And... Um, so again, yeah, there's a lot, a lot here, a lot. We'll get to that story. I know you love that story. We'll get I to that do. story eventually. That story we'll get to that. I don't know why. But if I say it today, you'll never come back. I hear you're in suspense. Because you have I to get to that Esau. story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. I'm sorry we didn't cover that many verses, but I think that we have enough here to keep uh, psychologists busy for decades. So we got it all in in one hour and five minutes. So we actually did very fast considering. So have, everyone should have a wonderful week. Next week is the fast day, but I think we could still learn even if there's no coffee, right? The 17th of Thomas is on Shabbos, but you lay it to Sunday. I think we could study Torah. Why not? Yeah, let's do that. In good health. Take care. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.